My friends, what is faith? What is the nature of faith? And what are its effects? The first thing that is necessary for every Christian is faith, without which no one is called a faithful Christian. Faith brings about four good effects. The first is that through faith, the soul is united to God, and by it, there is between the soul and God a union similar to marriage. As scripture says, I will espouse thee in faith. When a man is baptized, the first question he is asked is, do you believe in God? This is because baptism is the first sacrament of faith. Hence the Lord said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism without faith is of no value. In fact, it must be known that no one is acceptable before God unless he have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. St. Augustine explains the words of St. Paul, All that is not of faith is sin, in this way, Where there is no knowledge of the eternal and unchanging truth, virtue, even in the midst of the best moral life, is false. The second effect of faith is that eternal life begins in us. Because eternal life is nothing else than knowing God. The Lord announced this when he said, This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This knowledge of God begins here through faith, but it is perfected in the future life when we shall know God as he is. Therefore, St. Paul says, faith is the substance of things to be hoped for. No one, then, can arrive at the perfect happiness of heaven which is the true knowledge of God, unless first he knows God through faith. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. The third good that comes from faith is the right direction, which it gives to our present life. Now, in order for someone to live a good life, It is necessary that he knows what must be done to live the right way. If he depends on his own efforts alone for all this required knowledge, he will either never attain this knowledge, or if so, only after a long time. But faith teaches us all that is necessary to live a good life. It teaches us that there is one God who is the rewarder of good, and the punisher of evil. It teaches us that there is a life other than this one. And it teaches us other similar truths which help us desire to live the right way and to avoid evil. The just man liveth by faith. This is evident in that not one of the philosophers before the coming of Christ could, through his own powers, know God and the means necessary for salvation, as well as any old woman, since Christ's coming, knows him through faith. And, therefore, it is said in Isaiah that the earth is filled with the knowledge of God. The fourth effect of faith is that by it, we overcome temptations. The holy ones by faith conquered kingdoms. 
We know that every temptation is either from the world or the flesh or the devil. The devil would have us disobey God and not be subject to him. This is removed by faith, since through it we know that God is the Lord of all things and must therefore be obeyed. Scripture says, Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, strong in faith. The world tempts us, either by attaching us to it in prosperity or by filling us with fear of adversity. But faith overcomes this in that we believe in a life to come better than this one. And hence, we despise the riches of this world, and we are not terrified in the face of adversity. Scripture says, This is the victory which overcometh the world, our faith. The flesh, however, tempts us by attracting us to the swiftly passing pleasures of this present life. But faith shows us that if we cling to these things inordinately, we shall lose eternal joys. Scripture says, in all things, taking the shield of faith. We see from this that it is very necessary to have faith. Faith is the evidence of things that appear not. But someone might say, that it's foolish to believe in what cannot be seen, and that a man should not believe in things he cannot see. I answer by saying that the imperfect nature of our intellect takes away the basis of this difficulty. For if man of himself could in a perfect manner know all things visible and invisible, it would indeed be foolish to believe in what he does not see. But our manner of knowing is so weak that no philosopher could perfectly investigate the nature of even one little fly. We even read that a certain philosopher spent 30 years in solitude in order to know the nature of the bee. If, therefore, our intellect is so weak, it is foolish to be willing to believe only that which man can know by himself alone, especially in matters concerning God. The word of Job stands against this. Behold, God is great, exceeding our knowledge. One can also answer this question by supposing that a certain master had said something concerning his own special branch of knowledge, and some uneducated person would contradict him for no reason than that he could not understand what the master said. Such a person would be considered very foolish. The intellect of the angels greatly exceeds the intellect of the greatest philosopher, as much as that of the greatest philosopher exceeds the intellect of the uneducated man. Therefore, the philosopher is foolish if he refuses to believe what an angel says, and he is far greater a fool to refuse to believe what God says. To teach this, we have the words, For many things are shown to thee above the understanding of men. Then again, if we were willing to believe only those things which we know with certitude, we could not live in this world. How could we live unless we believe other people? We cannot even confirm that our Father is actually our Father. And so it's necessary that we believe others in matters which we cannot know perfectly ourselves. And no one deserves to be believed as much as God does. 
And so those who do not believe the words of faith are not wise, but foolish and proud. As the apostle says, he is proud, knowing nothing. And also, I know whom I have believed, and I am certain. And it is written, ye who fear the Lord, believe him, and your reward shall not be made void. Finally, one can also say that God proves the truth of the things which faith teaches. If a king sends letters signed with his seal, no one would dare to say that those letters did not represent the will of the king. In the same way, everything that the saints believed and handed down to us concerning the faith of Christ is signed with the seal of God. This seal consists of those works which no mere creature could accomplish. They are the miracles by which Christ confirmed the teachings of the apostles and the saints. If, however, you say that no one has witnessed these miracles, I would reply in the following way. It is a fact that the entire world worshipped idols and that the faith of Christ was persecuted, as even pagan accounts of history testify. But today, all have turned to Christ. Wise men and noble and rich, they have been converted by the words of the poor and simple preachers of Christ. Now, there were either miracles or there were not. If there were miracles, you have what you asked for, a visible fact. If there were not miracles, then there could not be a greater miracle than that the whole world should have been converted without miracles. And we need go no further. We are more certain, therefore, in believing the things of faith than those things which can be seen. Because God's knowledge never deceives us, but the visible sense of man is often in error. Among all the truths which the faithful must believe, this is the first. That there is one God. We must see that God is the ruler and provider of all things. He, therefore, believes in God who believes that everything in this world is governed and provided for by him. He who likes to believe that all things come into being by chance does not believe that there is a God. No one is so foolish as to deny that all nature, which operates with a certain definite time and order, is subject to the rule and foresight and an orderly arrangement of someone. We see how the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all natural things follow a determined course, which would be impossible if they were merely products of chance. And so, as the psalm says, he is indeed foolish who does not believe in God. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. There are those, however, who believe that God rules and sustains all things of nature, but do not believe that God oversees the acts of men. They believe that human acts do not come under God's providence. They think this way because they see in this world how the good are afflicted and how the evil enjoy good things, so that divine providence seems to disregard human affairs. The words of Job are often applied to this view. He doth not consider our things, and he walketh about the poles of heaven. But this is absurd. A person who is ignorant of medicine might see a doctor give water to one patient and wine to another. He might believe that this is mere chance, 
since he does not understand the science of medicine, which for good reasons prescribes wine to one and water to another. It is the same way with God. Because God, in his just and wise providence, knows what is good and necessary for men, so he afflicts some who are good and allows certain wicked men to prosper. But he is foolish indeed who believes this is due to chance, because he does not know the causes and method of God's dealings with men. And so Job says, I wish that God might speak with thee, and would open his lips to thee, that he might show thee the secrets of wisdom, and that his law is manifold, and thou mightest understand that he exacteth much less of thee than thy iniquity deserveth. We must, therefore, firmly believe that God governs and regulates not only all nature, but also the actions of men. As we hear in the psalm, And they said, The Lord shall not see, neither shall the one God of Jacob understand. Understand, ye senseless among the people, and you fools, be wise at last. He that planted the ear shall he not hear. He that formed the eye, doth he not consider? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men. God sees all things, both our thoughts and the hidden desires of our will. Thus, the necessity of doing good is especially imposed on man, since all his thoughts, words, and actions are known in the sight of God. All things are naked and open to his eyes. We believe that God, who rules and regulates all things, is one God. We can know this because wherever the regulation of human affairs is well arranged, there the group is found to be ruled and provided for by one, not many. For a number of heads often brings dissension in their subjects. But since divine government exceeds in every way that which is merely human, it is evident that the government of the world is not by many gods, but by one. There are four motives which have led men to believe in a number of gods. First, The dullness of the human intellect. Dull men, not capable of going beyond sensible things, did not believe anything existed except physical bodies. Hence they thought that the world is disposed and ruled by those bodies, which to them seemed most beautiful and most valuable in this world. And accordingly, to things such as the sun, the moon, and the stars, they attributed and gave a divine worship. These men are like those who, when going to a royal court to see the king, believe that whoever is sumptuously dressed or of official position is the king. The Bible says, They have imagined either the sun and the moon or the circle of the stars to be the gods that rule the world, with whose beauty, if they being delighted, took them to be gods. The second motive was human praise. Some men, wishing to flatter kings and rulers, obey and subject themselves to them, and show them honor which is due to God alone. After the death of these rulers, sometimes men make them gods, and sometimes this is done even when they are still alive. The human affection for sons and relatives is a third motive. Some people, because of the excessive love which they had for their family, caused statues of them 
to be erected after their death, and gradually a divine honor was attached to these statues. And so we read, For men serving either their affections or their kings gave the incommunicable name to stones and wood. The fourth and last motive is the malice of the devil. The devil wished from the beginning to be equal to God. And so he said, I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The devil still entertains this desire. His entire purpose is to make men adore him and offer sacrifices to him. It isn't that he takes delight in the dogs or cats that are sacrificed to him, but he does relish the fact that by these acts, irreverence is shown to God. And so he spoke to Christ. All these things I will give thee, if falling down, Thou wilt adore me. For this same reason, those demons who entered into idols said they would be venerated as gods. The psalm says, All the gods of the Gentiles are demons. The things which the heathen sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. All this is terrible to contemplate. But at times, people fall into these four causes. Sometimes it's not by their words and hearts, but by their actions, that they show they believe in many gods. For example, those who believe that the celestial bodies influence the will of man and regulate their affairs by astrology. Really, they make the heavenly bodies into gods, and they subject themselves to them. In the same category are all those who obey temporal rulers more than God. These people actually set their leaders up as gods. But we ought to obey God rather than men. So too, those who love their sons and family members more than God show by their actions that they believe in many gods. Also, there are those who love food more than God. As scripture says, whose God is their belly. And lastly, all who take part in magic or in incantations believe that the demons are gods because they seek from the devil that which God alone can give such as revealing the future or discovering hidden things. My friends, beware of all these things. We must believe that there is only one God.